Hi everyone, it's Allie and I am here to do another installment of my What I Have Learned From Insert Tarot Deck Here. And today I'm very excited to be talking about the Way Home Tarot. Hooray! Now this is an independently produced deck, um, but I think you can still get it from, I'll link the creator's shop below. She actually has a full store of metaphysical supplies, um, like a brick and mortar store as well as an online store. And I think it's quite reasonably priced uh, if you are in America <laughs> and you're not paying shipping and all that nonsense. Um, but I have to say that I love this deck so much. I would rebuy it in a heartbeat if something happened to it. This is a great deck. So it's created by Bakara Wintner and Autumn Whitehurst. And my um, great box. My experience of the deck was this. So I, like many people, bought Bakara Wintner's book, WTF is Tarot, and read it from cover to cover and saw that there were sort of different illustrations, not traditional Waitsmith illustrations or anything like that. Um, and I'm not sure if at that time there was a fully published tarot deck because the illustrations are from The Way Home Tarot or if um, this came after. But certainly for me, it was that I bought the book, read the book, discovered the deck, bought the deck, have not used the book since. Um, so I really did enjoy the book, but the images are so evocative in and of their own. It's not like I feel like I've had to go really back to the book. So while I have taken on board some of the things she said in the book, and I do really appreciate it, I still have it somewhere. This house, since I had to move everything I would normally keep at my job to my home, I just can't find anything anymore. Um, but uh, I'm not drawing on the book here specifically, but things I say may have come from the book and I just don't remember. <laughs> so that's how we're going ahead with this little video. So if you're new to this channel or to this series, this is not a full walkthrough. What I do is just select certain cards that I feel like have taught me something about tarot or made me see the meaning of a card in a new way or just something I really appreciate. Uh, and so then we're just going to go through a bunch of majors today. I couldn't help myself. And then some of the minors, and I will link to full walkthroughs if you are interested in further seeing more images of this deck or pursuing buying it for yourself. Um, but that's uh, what I'm going to do. So aesthetically, this deck, and you'll see when I show you the images, it's like for me a mashup of the wild unknown. There's a lot of animal gen imagery in here. The naked heart, because it's colorful in the way that the naked heart is color colorful, plus animal imagery. Um, and also the spacious tarot, because there's actually, until you get to the courts, there's not a lot of human elements in this deck. So it just really works for me, guys. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with, and I, like I said, I'm going to try and go quickly because I have a bunch of majors in here, but I just love them all so much. So I'm going to start with the Empress and the Emperor. Now, oh gosh, here's where you can right away see, to me, like some of the links to the wild unknown, right? So where we have the Empress and the Emperor as two trees, uh, the Emperor as a coniferous tree that stays green year round, and the Empress is, actually the Empress is super interesting because it's like a mashup of two different uh, trees, deciduous trees, a willow and then something else green and leafy. So I find that super fascinating, like, like, bringing things together and building sort of new material. Uh, and both of them have elaborate root systems, one into the brain and one into the heart. Like, isn't that just perfect? Um, I like the inversion of color. The emperor is color at the top and the empress has color at the bottom. I just think they're such a gorgeous pair. And what a great distillation of emperor and empress energies in that particular deck. The chariot is great. I usually have no feelings about a chariot card. It just doesn't tend to move me particularly. Like I'll take the message on board and incorporate it in readings, but I'm not, I'm never flipping through the deck being like, oh, what's the chariot look like? This doesn't do anything for me. Um, but this one is amazing because so often, and it's understandably, the imagery of the chariot is that of being pulled, right? In the case of the traditional smith weight, it's being maybe pulled in two different directions, right? But that the that you are being pulled along. 
But the salmon swimming upstream to spawn is just an act of sheer force and will. If you've never looked up salmon swimming upstream, look it up on YouTube. It's unbelievable and it's purely instinctive, right? So in this chariot, you are going the difficult path and you have the strength to do it and it is the right thing to do and you're doing it on your own steam. It's not like you're being pulled forward, but this forceful, powerful movement is the point. And I just really love that, that take on it. Um, do look it up if you haven't seen it because it is bananas. I'm like, guys, just go downstream. I don't know what in their, in their genetic history makes them decide to do so much work, but um, it's amazing. Uh, I love the hermit. Come on hibernating bear. First of all, you guys know I love a winter scene on a tarot card. It's the Canadian. I mean, guys, I love winter so much. I, Canadians crab about it, but um, I'm pretty far south in Canada, so I don't get harsh, harsh winters, but man, I just love it so much. Um, but I really love this depiction of the hermit because I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? Like that, this seems like a really straightforward card, but also this is necessary for survival. I think so often in our fast paced worlds, we think, oh, well, I'll take time when I get time or um, like I'm lazy or I shouldn't, I shouldn't need this, but we do, we all need it and it is important. And in the case of the bear it is such an important function of life cycle that they will not survive if they do not do it. So I think that's a really positive message for the Hermit card and one I like very much. And he's got like a little fly, a little firefly in there with him. I think it's sort of, um, it, it's sort of practical to sort of light up the space to give some natural light. Um, but the firefly is going to come back. So we'll, we'll talk about the firefly later. The fortune card. Now, <laughs> ever since Se Stranger Things season three, this reminds me of Stranger Things because... <laughs> Um, although I don't even think there's really a, is there a scene like this? I can't remember, but like there's in the third season, there's a big carnival on the 4th of July. That's a big set piece in the series. And you can see here, like the forest is becoming part of the Ferris wheel in this sort of ominous looking way. So this was not, this is not an homage to Stranger Things. This predated Stranger Things season three, but I can't get it out of my head now that it's in there. Um, but I do really like this idea of the wheel of fortune of being just, like inevitability and to be kind of celebrated, right? This sort of carnival atmosphere of it all. Like it's nothing good can last forever. And it's a bummer sometimes when the wheel turns and you go back to the bottom, but it's just how it goes. If you're on a Ferris wheel, that ride is going to end and it will be a bummer, but that's just how it goes. And having that sort of, sort of physically distanced, still being able to see the constellations in the sky, understanding of fortune is just something I really like. And I think it's, I think it's really neat. Strength. Now I just want to give a shout out to the strength card for putting a snake on it. Uh, I really like snakes. Um, I'm not frightened of snakes. I love it when I see them out in the wild. My mother who was afraid of snakes was horrified because I once found a garter snake in the backyard and called him Sammy the snake. And I wanted to bring him in and keep him as a pet. Uh, but I really like it because often we see them associated with maybe the lover's card or sort of like deceptive devil. They have a pretty negative um, connotation. But we can see we've got the infinity symbol here of the strength card and it's winding its way through a symbol of death, the skull, but also through these really delicate, beautiful flowers, a symbol of life. And I think it's just great. And if you've ever held a snake, which I recommend. They feel amazing. It's not slimy. It's not gross. It's so cool. It's all muscle. Like it's all power when you're whole, even just a little snake, you can feel it in their bodies. And I just love the appreciation of the snake. Like, I don't think I'd ever have one as a pet because I want to like cuddle and romp with my pets, but, um, I think it's beautiful. If you don't like snakes, that's a bit of a bummer. I struggle with tarot spiders. Um, when they turn up because I just I have a thing with spiders Okay, before I show the death card, I do want to say that it is um, a difficult card to look at There's blood and viscera and bone and there's a depiction of a dead animal a dead cute animal, too So if this is not your bag do look away. It's not the easiest card to look at So I'm going to show it now and then I want to talk about why I put it on this list as 
learning from it. So this is the card. It is hard to look at. It's such an innocent little animal, clearly a young fawn, um, and it has been torn apart. But the rest of the card is very peaceful. Um, you know, the, the pine cones and the little green grasses. And we have the sense that this was an attack and a kill by another animal that was just looking to promote its own survival, right? That from death comes life. And then when that body decomposes, life will come from that into the ground as well. One of the things I really like about the wild unknown is the real distinction between the death depicted in the death card and the death depicted in the Ten of Swords card. And I think this deck also does it beautifully. So I'm going to put this to the side. I will show it again briefly when we get to the Ten of Swords, which is also a very difficult card. So I'll give you a warning in case you want to boop boop ahead in the video. I'm just going to put it over to the side there. Uh, Devil. Now I, this is very personal for me. Uh, and I've seen people say they don't love this devil card, which I totally get. This is just my thing. So here it is. Now, if you've been on this channel for a while, you'll know that I'm a horse lover. I talked about the beautiful use of the horse in the Wild Unknown deck. I did a whole video. You can look it up about the horses in the Smithweight tarot system. Uh, and this is the only... Oh, now that I'm saying that, I'm not 100%, but I'm 99% sure this is the only depiction of horses in this deck. 99%. And it's the devil card, which is interesting. Now, we have the sort of inverted pentagram on um, the face, the sort of the the bridle. I mean, it's a ridiculous bridle. Like, such a thing does not exist in the horse world with that particular leather shape on the face. It's totally bonkers. Um, but I find it extremely powerful. Uh these horses are unable to move as they are. They're adorned in a way that they not would not be in the wild. And they are totally controlled by the tack that they're wearing. And for me, this really works, actually. It's just sort of my own... So I can't... Having a horse is a very expensive and time-consuming pursuit. And I've just decided that in my life right now... I cannot have a horse of my own and do the other things I want to do and have money, have money. <laughs> it's very expensive uh, because as a horse owner, I would want to be there every single day and build a relationship with that horse. And as I've gotten older, although I used to spend, I used to look after a herd of 50 horses in my old job and take people for long horseback rides. I probably rode for six to seven hours a day. Um, but I've decided for myself and I don't expect anybody to share this, this is super personal probably not even relevant or important for this video, but I don't, I don't want to ride horses anymore. Like I'm not sure of my ethical position of just going out once a week and riding a horse that's not mine and not building the relationship just because I find it fun. Um, I don't think that's for me anymore. I would, if I could build that relationship and feel like it was a real partnership with that horse and that's something I would still want to pursue. I don't want to do it any other way. So therefore I'm just not doing it at that's this point in my life if I come across them there's lots of horses in the area where I live and I scratch their noses and give them love and I there's a horse I go groom sometimes and so that's all great but I'm just not gonna do that I'm not going to do that and this is very much about like showmanship and obedience and doing what you're told and being in the harness and it's got those same sort of carnival lights that we saw on the wheel of fortune um and the horses don't look super happy about it their eyes are quite wide their ears are back-ish, not totally pinned, but not totally relaxed either. Um, so they are being constrained by this thing that's holding them in. So for that, I think this is a great devil card. Other people don't love it. Totally get that too. This is just really personal for me and sort of my journey with that part of my life. The moon. Oh God, I love the moon card. So we've got a lot of traditional imagery here. Um of the wolf and the dog and the crab and the moon. Um, but I love that the wolf and the dog are inversions of each other, that they're somehow embodying the same spirit uh, and to two halves of one whole with the crab breaking out of the water between them. I just think it's a really nice aspect of that sort of mysteries and secrets um, and sort of going inwards and discovering things about yourself. Uh, I just, mm, great. 
And finally, the universe. Oh, this is, okay, sorry, it's a world card, but in this deck, it's called the universe. It's my favorite world card of any tarot deck that I have. Again, you can see the Canadian influence here. Like, not, she's not Canadian, <laughs> although I think she's from the Northeast, so she probably has similar things. But, um, like, the Aurora Borealis and the winter scene and the warm, cozy cabin and the campfire outside. But what I love about this is the simplicity of it, right? That it, your universe, your completion, your wholeness, it doesn't have to be big and elaborate. It's simple and finding the beauty in the everyday. It's great to be ambitious. It's great to have goals and dreams and all of that. But like, make sure it's what's really going to make you happy and not just about acquiring stuff or like, you know, how do I get mine and how do I make it bigger? Like that's, this is where the universe lies is this quiet sort of beauty. So, oh, I love it. And that's my trip through the majors. Okay, so let's talk about some minors. I think I'm gonna start with the swords just because I pulled all of the swords courts so I could talk about the courts because the courts in this deck are super cool. Um, so I'll show a couple different, oh, I've got the eight, nine, 10, how funny. I'll show a couple different cards and then I'll get into the courts. Um, I think I've got a few more courts in here, but eight of swords, there's our other firefly. So we saw the firefly in the hermit's cave um, so this sort of willing removal, right, from society. Uh oh, the light's creeping in. I'm gonna start having problems. Uh, but in this card, like he thinks he's trapped. But what I love about it is the light is coming from within, right? So you can get out of there, little firefly. You have everything you need. You're the one illuminating and creating those scary shadows. That's coming from you. You get yourself out. Um, I just that's the whole point of the Eight of Swords card to me. It's why I didn't like, um, there's a deck called the After Tarot that shows the moment after the traditional Waitsmith illustrations, like it, it's re-illustrated in that moment after. And some of them are super cool, but then I saw the Eight of Swords and it's just like some dude cutting the girl free from her bindings. Like, no, 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 no. She gets herself out of that, pal. I don't own that deck. A nine of swords. Oof, this one's a toughie too. Right? So I like this because the nine of swords is often, like I often interpreted it as this nightmarish thing where your wheels are spinning and you're not thinking rationally anymore. And I don't think this card is that. This gave me a whole new appreciation for the nine of swords. So immediately what this makes me think of is climate change, right? Like in the last month, Ontario's West Coast was burning and is, is still burning and bad things are happening. Europe is flooding, like things are happening that are not great in our world. And um, part of the, the, ch the challenge of this card, I think, is that climate change is such an existential threat that it's so easy to feel powerless and do nothing, right? Uh, but that's a trap. <laughs> if everybody does nothing, then the, the existential threat becomes just the threat and the reality. So don't think, do what you can. Don't get spin your wheels in the, well, it's too big, I can do nothing. Because if everybody does that, we're screwed. Um, so I really like that take on the Nine of Swords. And while I said this is not a very human influence deck, we see human influence as often negative. The binding of the horses into their tack in the devil card, our human created smokestacks in the nine of swords. Like I think it's a really valuable lesson for that card. Now the ten of swords is also difficult. Like I said before, like the death card, it involves a dead animal um, in and a disturbing image. So if you don't want to see that, it's not bloody and gory. So if that's your thing, you can probably look. But um, if you want to boop boop ahead, I do not blame you. So. I talked about how, for me, it's super important to have that distinction between the death card and the 10 of swords. So just briefly, here's the death card again, right? And here's the 10 of swords. So it's a dead pelican with garbage inside it, right? So it's like they've done a little pelican autopsy and it's just trash, it's just refuse. It's probably hard to see, um, so, like there's a spring in there. It looks like a candy wrapper, um, the top of a water bottle, like just junk is in there. Um, so this is a needless death that 
that nobody benefits from. <laughs> like, like, I mean, well, we benefit from, from seeing into the pelican and knowing what to do differently, right? That we have a message from that death. Uh, whereas the death and the death card, I won't show it again, um, but it's another animal has taken it for its own life and survival, that it's that dichotomy of death and life and moving into something new, some new phase of those cycle. Um, but the Ten of Swords is a death that maybe could have been avoided and what learning are we going to take into the next step in order that this difficult time doesn't repeat itself. Um, so I really think those are that's a valuable one, even though it's awful and hard to look at and involves the suffering of an animal. Yikes. Okay, so can I get out of the sunshine here? Oh, God. Uh, so this court cards are cool. They're silhouettes of people with sort of elemental things inside them. And when I saw this deck online, I almost didn't buy it because of this, because I was like, dumb. I didn't like it. I don't know why I was so against it. But I liked the other cards so much. I was like, okay, let's deal with the courts. And now I love them. I love them. So just as an example, so we have the Daughter of Swords. And, you know, it's interesting. It's hard, I think, to depict air as an element when you've got this sort of thing. So while we might look at snowflakes as a water element, um, I think of them moving through the air. So we've got our air element, and they're all different, right? That's the thing about snowflakes. They're all crystalline. And um, I, I don't think that's actually statistically true that they're all, there has never been a duplicate snowflake. Maybe it is. But uh, this idea that there's so many possibilities, and she's in this classic thinker pose, thinking about all the different ideas and possibilities. Oh, and sorry, the renaming of the cards. Daughter, son, mother, father, rather than page, knight, king, queen. So then we get to the son of swords, and if you think of the knight of swords, he's like that super action, speed, go, go, go. And here's his tempest. Right? So his air is blowing. If it's not carefully directed, it's going to be destructive, right? It doesn't really listen necessarily sometimes to rhyme or reason. So isn't that a great depiction of the Son of Swords energy there? Now, the Mother of Swords, let's look at next to the Daughter of Swords, right? So we've taken this sort of snowflake idea and we have crystallized it into something beautiful. So whereas the ideas, the thoughts are all floating around and still possibility we're in the page level, by the time we get to the queen, look at her stance, isn't she such a boss? Um, and it's going to be hard to have it show on screen, but within the icicles are these individual snowflakes that are so unique, like she's taken them and made them into something. So I love that link. And similarly, if we've got our son of swords blowing his air all over the place and, you know, being a bit of a, a knob about it. Here's the father of swords, right? With his use for the air, for something productive, he's found a way to channel that energy and have it with confidence and purpose and use. And now oh, he's back in the thinking position again, right? What's my next thing? What's my next pursuit? My next intellectual challenge? So isn't that so cool, you guys? Man, I love the courts now. I don't know why I was so crabby about it when I first saw them online. Contradictory. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, I don't think I need to go in any specific way here. Uh, let's talk about the cups next. So here I've got the eight, oh, I've got another eight and a 10. How funny. And the son and father. Oh, oh no, I've got some ones that aren't eights and tens. This one just made me laugh. Uh, you know, the Eight of Cups, so traditionally it's a figure walking away from the eight carefully stacked cups. Uh, so there's been some work put in, right, before things, before you move away, right? You've done the stacking, you've done the organizing, but it is time to go. And I love this octopus has, like, really tried with all his arms <laughs> to, like, get it together. And there's some cups and junk, but they're broken. Like, it is time for this octopus to just, like, move away from this trash and just just get get going um and i just thought the eight arms and the eight cups just tickled me now the ten of cups when i first got this deck i was like boring don't like it but the more i thought about it the more i think it's brilliant so we've got ten cups here so this is the traditional like family card the parents the kids dancing around under the rainbow super happy everybody loves to get the ten of cups card 
But when you're, and I'm talking about family too, metaphorically, of course, but when you're putting together a happy family, there are disparate elements to that, right? Kids are different. Siblings don't come out all exactly the same. And you've got blended families and you've got families that are not biologically related, but just bound together by love. And like, there's all these different cups. So they don't stack perfectly. And they're in a stack now, but, and you can see the rainbows coming through them, right? The crystal like radiating out that rainbow, which I love. Like it's not the rainbow over the family, but it's coming out of their love, which is so sweet. But to maintain that stack takes some care and work. Like if you don't pay attention to one of those cups, the whole system's gonna fall down and people are gonna get hurt. And I think a lot of times we can take those family structures in our lives for granted. And it's just a reminder, I, I think, to not do that, to cherish it and love it and nurture it and allow it to keep standing that way. So I really like it. The Son of Cups, right? So we have our Knight of Cups. Mr. Romantic. Uh, and I love that like he's clearly in touch with his own emotions, right? We've got the stream flowing through him of emotion. He's drinking a cup of water exactly the same color as the stream. Um, but it also, I think, gives me a bit of the sense of the warning of the Knight of Cups, right? Like, like that sort of love bombing, like Romeo rushing into things too much. Too much of any of these cards is not good. And uh, same thing with the Son of Cups. Um, but I like that he's sort of feeding his own emotions. Uh, I think that's very apropos for this card. Now the Father of Cups is super cool. So again, if we link the, the, the son and father, daughter, mother. So here, um, he also is, you can see at the top of his head in the silhouette, we've got an upside down cup and it's running, running, running. Isn't that interesting? But if you invert it, like a swamp like which is super important to any ecosystem things are growing out of that emotion so it's not just this constant emotional cycle that can be so tiring in young immature love like we might have with the night but this is like a an emotional ecosystem that is fully formed and thriving within itself and within the father of cups so i think that's super cool too all right, pentacles and wands. Oh, I'm going to go a bit over my 30 minutes. I'll do my best. Uh, so here we have the three of pentacles. So that's a card of organization and building things according to a blueprint. But I love the idea that it's an anthill because from the outside to a human eye, an anthill looks just like chaos, right? It doesn't look like it's organized. And I think it's a great message. Like if someone doesn't understand your plan, who cares? You got this. You know what it is that you're building and what, how you want to do it and what's going to work best for you. So if it looks like chaos to someone else, I mean, you can take their opinion on board for sure, but do you. Like an ant. <laughs> oh, the Four of Pentacles makes me laugh too. Like, I don't have too much to say about this, except for there's a sense of immediacy to this card. Like you're going to have to get off right? These lily pads aren't going to support you forever. They're going to float in different directions and you're going to have to jump. Whereas in the Waite Smith, he looks very comfortable on that chest and holding the four coins close to him and not sharing them out. Like there's going to be a physical reality where you can't do this anymore. So just do it now. It's going to, it's going to harm you if you stay there. It's better to move from it. Five of Pentacles is a tomato blight. Which I think is really perfect because like there's potential there and potential for nourishment. If we look at that five of pentacles with people shut outside in the cold, um, like there shouldn't be that. <laughs> we should always work to make sure that our fellow man, fellow people are uh, nourished and happy and healthy and safe however we can. So this idea of this potential nourishment just being infected in some way is really great distillation of what that means um, in the Five of Pentacles. And again, in the Waite Smith, they're outside of a church, right? Like there are these opportunities, but somehow they're outside of that. How do we get them on the inside? How do we remove that blight of poverty or hunger or um, just emotional um, harm and hunger, that emotional hunger? How do we make sure everyone's emotionally safe and fed and that kind of thing. And the Son of Pentacles. 
Uh, I love this idea that he is working and growing within himself and that you can see where he's been. Again, you know I love a Knight of Pentacles. It's one of my it's my favorite court card and one of my favorite cards in the deck. Um, because it's got such a sense of like hard work and knowledge of where he came from and history and um I really like it. And finally, the wands. So I am gonna go over 30. Sorry guys. I just like this deck a lot. It's perfect. The three of wands looking out into an adventure. Her night skies are just so stunning, right? Like you're in this sort of white bland void now, but what adventure waits? Let's walk through that structure. Ugh, love it. Um, the six of wands I think is interesting. Look at the colors again, it's such a great deck. Um, because this is your victory. <laughs> The Six of Wands and the Wait Smith, you're off to the side and looking at the rider who's sort of riding in. And I think it's a much more ambiguous card. Um, but you have your path lighted towards the sunrise. And I think it's just such a beautiful depiction and puts you really in the card um, towards your own path. But you still have to get there on your own steam, right? You're almost there. So get yourself there. I quite like the Eight of Wands because uh, it shows where the inception of the movement comes from. Rather than seeing Eight Wands flinging through the sky, you see the bolt of lightning and it looks like they are actually maybe going to go out into different directions. Um, so this is more about the inception moment of when something is going to happen than the flinging forward of the wands. So don't let those opportunities pass you by, right? This is going to be an energizer, a catalyst for what you have coming. Make it work for you. So I really like that. And then finally, the Ten of Wands. I like this because it just seems like a card of effort, right? The Ten Burned Out Matches, um, you've been trying to get through this material, this card or this piece of paper, and you've done it, right? It's there, you've done the work, and now you can celebrate. Uh, although you haven't gone through the hole yet. Um, so I think that's a really great, simple, but effective depiction of the Ten of Wands. Okay, so that is the Way Home Tarot by Bakara Wintner and Autumn Whitehurst. I'll put a link to some walkthroughs below to our store where you can pick it up if you're interested in it. And I hope you enjoyed that. Gosh, I loved making it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.